right. Well, then we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome. I'm so glad to see you all here. It's like a little, our little extended library family, our English department. <laughs> um, but I know that uh, uh, obviously we have MLA 8 is something new, and I know that some of you are already implementing that. I mm-hmm. imagine maybe everybody is probably so far. Um, so I just kind of wanted to touch base with everybody and kind of share with you the resources that we have that we're providing to students and then kind of um, have some things that maybe we can discuss and kind of go over some of the changes and um, kind of look at and just, just I think sometimes it's hard you hear about the new things and I don't know if anyone's had the, the lovely experience of that sitting down and reading this lovely little did you, anybody have quality time <laughs> over <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> <laughs> this little root canal experience but um but I think sometimes it's good to just kind of stop and like carve out a tiny little bit of time to have a root canal together as a group. <laughs> so I know, yeah, we don't have any votes to, to share with you today, I'm sorry. Um, but I did, I, I have um, tried to spend a little bit of time with this when I was making some of our resources just to kind of wrap my, brain, my head around it a little bit too. So I kind of wanted to share that with you. I did have a, a little packet that I put together that are things that we have um, available for students and then also the orange thing is actually kind of um, for you in mind. So I just want to share some of that with you and then I'll also, if we have time, we can do an activity where you can create citations, well, the fun citations that you encourage your students to take part in. Maybe mm-hmm. we can try it out a little bit and create them ourselves. So that's kind of my goal, but we'll kind of see. I'm, I'm flexible to, to kind of talk about some things. <laughs> so um, obviously, uh, anytime you've done instruction with us, you know that we always start with the library website. So we do have a lot of resources here. Um, we're going to focus, obviously, today just on the citation information. Um, but I did kind of create a guide that's specifically for this workshop today, too. But um, all of our citation information is here on our website. And we have an MLA section. And for those of you who might be a little wary to go to 8, or if you know anybody who is, you can tell them we have a little secret MLA 7 here that's still here. So all of our information for 7 is still available. So our, our MLA 8 guide is here. Uh, and that's kind of the default of that citations tab. So we do have a PowerPoint here that we use with the students when we're kind of introducing the idea of formatting and in-text citations and some of the basic things that I know that you're familiar with so we won't be talking about today. But you can always let, um, guide students here if you, in case you have any questions or people who are asking questions about it. Um, we have our copies of our MLA handbook, as we call the Bible, as you know. It's a thinner Bible and more colorful Bible these days, so I can look like that. <laughs> and then we have our, our citation guidelines, which is the green handout that you have. Uh, the practice template, which we'll also look at, that we've created. There's a blank template, and then there's also a template that we've made that has some um, kind of like guidelines that will help kind of hold people's hand as they're completing the template, if that's useful to them. The in-text citations handout, which is also in your packet. Uh, we, so we have all of that available on our website if you wanted to download those or link to those on Blackboard to share with students as resources. They're all in this one location. Uh, we also have a sample paper that is in MLA 8 format, if that's helpful at all to show people. Um, and also the Purdue's online writing lab, which I know you've all made useful uh, use of. And then um, the new MLA 8 has a, their own new style center, so they have a lot of really good resources in the style center. And I'll touch a little bit about some of those today, but there's a link to that um, here. And then also the MLA 7 information is there. And we also have some new videos, and I know some of you have watched our videos, but I'll show you probably just one of them today just to kind of give you an idea. But we do have those that you're welcome to use. Um, in class or have students watch them from home. Yeah. Can I just ask a question sure. about the video that has like the Tupperware containers? Yes. Did you guys produce that in house or how was that? No, we, we outsource that. There's an academic librarian that's from Illinois that mm-hmm. actually we paid for him to do that through equity funds. And so the videos have student equity funds. Such an awesome them. video. I love oh it. good. Yeah. I'm really glad. We we found them and we they, they can kind of brand them to our library and mm-hmm. then we got to run the script. We actually ran the script through Roberta and I think Carson gave us a little bit of, and mm-hmm. he gave us some, yeah, there's a few people that we sent it out to. We didn't send it to the large group because no, it was too much information, no, it's, but it's awesome. good. And if you see any um, edits or anything to it, he's yeah. actually already, we one thing, one little thing that we asked him to change, he'll go back and change it and re-record the audio. So he's been really responsive. But we were trying to be really detailed about making yeah. sure that it, yeah. it was a good example. Yeah. But yeah, I'm glad you liked it. Thank yeah. you for your YouTube comment <laughs> on the video. I thought, oh, yeah, you're <laughs> Um, but that's available. We I have a few that he made for us actually, and then there's another one here that's called "Using Other People's Ideas About Plagiarism and How to Do In-Text Citations," and it's really specific to that topic. 
So that's another um, video. And then afterwards, I found another video that we did not pay for, but I did ask for permission. And the guy was laughing at me like, you need to ask permission. And I'm like, well, <laughs> we're talking about documentation and everything. And he does a really nice job. This video is actually quite a bit longer. It's about 11 minutes. This one's about five minutes. And um, he does a really nice job of kind of explaining like the periods and the commas and things like that. But it's called Understanding MLA Style at the bottom there. Um, so for, for today, I just kind of want to highlight some of the, the changes and kind of talk about some of those too. And, and ask your opinion about some things as well. So the, the major differences I think a lot of people are asking, you know, why why did it change? And you've been here probably long enough to have it has changed, you know, several times already. But in the in in general, uh, the reason that they that they give in the beginning of the book actually is um, to give more freedom to create references that fit the audiences. So it's more kind of it's a little bit flexible, which I think is kind of frustrating to students and also faculty because they're like, I just want to know what's the rule and I'll follow it. But it's made to be a little bit more flexible, give more freedom, more flexibility in, in ways to accommodate new media. So new media is like tweets and blogs and social media and videos that they watch on Hulu and different kinds of things like that. So it's trying to cite the president. Yeah, exactly. Because there's a lot of tweets out there that are people are talking about. Yes, exactly. So, and, and the old MLA style had a way to do that, but this is a lot more, you know, kind of formalizing it a little bit, I think, because it's such a huge um, new content that we're seeing. And also emphasizing the importance of inclusion of a reliable data trail. So obviously we know that in documentation we're trying to show the student, you know, the, the reader, where did you get the information from. Um, so those are kind of the, the major the major reasons I would say that they gave their changes. Um, they're also acknowledging that sources are discovered in locations and also formats that aren't in the original format, which we've seen a lot, especially with English related um, resources where something was published um, in a journal, then it appeared in an anthology, then it appeared in a database or an ebook or something. So there's these these different kinds of of packages, and so one of the new things with MLA 8 is they're now talking about containers, and they use the, the, the name of a container is to kind of explain that concept of they're, they're living in different places. There's some instructors who, who um, to ask the students to find and cite the original place where it was born, as um, Ms. Isol actually calls it that. She says, I want to I wanna find where it was born, and then where it moved to, and then where you're actually interacting with it. So some instructors want to include all of those paths, and some are just wanting to find out what are you looking at right now. So those are obviously decisions that you can make individually. And we always tell students that, you know, whatever your teacher is actually requiring, and they're the ones creating your paper, and they're the ones that are the, you know, the be all and end all to the, to the rules. But these are just um, guidelines in a sense. Um, so I think in general, they, they, these changes are reflecting this idea of scholarly uh, communication, scholarly conversation, where we're talking about where did you get your sources, where can you get more information. And even in information literacy, scholarly communication is kind of a, one of our information literacy components about people talking about um, sharing information with other communities. So, um, so those are kind of the reasons for the change in, in general. And it is, is also moving, a big thing, that it's moving away from a prescriptive format where our handout would have title, uh, how to cite a book, how to cite an article, how to cite a website. It's not based on format anymore. It's now based on the core elements. Mm -hmm. So that's a major shift in, you know, where's your handout that says, like, I have a book. How do you do a book? Mm -hmm. It's not about that anymore. It's about uh, these individual elements and if you have them available to you or not. So that's what the table in the middle is, is the, their template that they're using. And this is an example of one container. So if you had multiple containers, then you would have these kinds of things kind of stacked on top of themselves. So any thoughts on any of that so far? How are you feeling about the change overall? Just curious. Cool. I'm curious about the container. Like, what is that specifically? It could be Tupperware. It's a metaphor. Now that we, now that there are so many sources that are digital, it's kind of a metaphor that sort of describes like journal could be considered a container, and then that contain like, it contains articles, right? And then a journal would be inside of a database, and that's a larger container. So there's this really cool website um, that kind of uses Tupperware to kind of uh, uh, as a visual metaphor to, to describe it. Okay. And since we're talking about that, I was going to show you this later, but I noticed today 
<laughs> my container. <laughs> and um, I have other containers in it. Oh, I see. Okay. So this could be, like, for example, if I have a source, mm -hmm. and in this case, I think I made this. This is a web page. Mm -hmm. So it's a web page. They're looking at the actual page, but the page is housed in the container. Anybody know what the container would be for a web page? Website. The website. So this is you citing the website would be in that container. But that website maybe was found on a database like Opposing Viewpoints, which also catalogs really quality websites. And so that would be found in this container that's Opposing Viewpoints database. So you'd cite the database and then also the website where that is stored. So you really have to know the genealogy, so to speak, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you have to list all of that. So the entries are going to be quite long. They're a little bit longer if you have multiple containers. But if you just have a website, it's really short and sweet. And if you don't have an author, then it's even like shorter. I put the, the website again, the link instead of the web access date. Yeah, that's something that we can talk about too, because they do have optional elements in these oh. four elements, and uh, you can choose whether you want the students to include the URL or not. But that is one thing okay. that, that we're talking about too. Yeah, yeah, that's one thing I hear most people. Most people say, "Why do they bring back the URL?" Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I know. You're Sorry, I'm grumpy about that. <laughs> and that's, oh, it depends yeah. on how long it is, though, because. Yeah. Sometimes the URL is like three or four lines of text, and that makes the, you know, the yeah, that's well, and for them turning in papers, you're never going to pop, sit there and type that, right? But they, mm -hmm. it's a hyperlink or something well, like that, you're going to click it. Me, well, yeah, so yeah. it depends on um, yeah. our containers, what we want yeah. from them, right? But, yeah. 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 So the things that have not changed on the right-hand side is the format of the paper. So all the, you know, header and the, mm -hmm. you know, all that kind of thing, that's the same. The in-text cit citations primarily have not changed, but they do have a few things that they've clarified. So we can look at that and kind of um, just kind of get an overview of some of those things. And it's also listed on that orange sheet, actually. Um, so some of the things in terms of the in-text citations, if you want to peek really quick, on the second page toward the bottom here, there's a list of in-text citations. It just shows the principles behind these um, are unchanged, and a few details have been added for clear <coughs> or clarified. So there's just some minor things there. But for novels, they want the chapter and the page. That's one of the things we know. Roberta and I know, so that's a big difference. Okay, that might, it doesn't look like they're explicit about that here, uh, but um, we can, yeah, if, that, if it says it in the MLA guide. Some, yeah. And sometimes if you're citing a video, there's a little bit more detail, like you, if you if you require this, obviously, the seconds and the minute and that type of thing. If you were trying, say it's a film class and you're citing some scene and that's important. But I think those kinds of details are only important if that if your reader needs that or if your teacher is asking for that and that's where the flexibility with MLA 8 comes in is if you know you don't they don't one of the things that's different is you're not including the city of publication anymore but if you're citing something where the city is relevant to like it's the British version of Harry Potter or something and there's some different language or something going on then you might want to include London or something so it you can kind of, it's based on what's necessary for the, the, the at the point of need but that's a little bit of the in-text citations. Um, there's also, uh, okay, so they have the, the template is not based on citation. We kind of talked about that a little bit. It's, us, it's used for all citations. So that's what students are coming to the desk right now and saying, so I have this, actually someone just came in and said, I did all this paper in APA, but I actually needed to be MLA. So can you help me <laughs> transfer it over? Mm -hmm. And so it's different. It's a completely different way of looking at it because now we just need to go, number one, do you have an author? Yes, no, maybe so. Maybe it's an editor and you do it a little bit differently that way if you have the title of the source, the title of the container. So we just go methodically. So that's that's all it is, no matter what the source. If it's a tweet, who's the author of the tweet? You know, what's the title of the, the tweet? <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, so the core elements, those are kind of at the core of the actual format. And that's kind of just referring to the center there. The other changes is that the URL um, is optional. Uh, for other sources, and this is one thing I was kind of curious about. Uh, when you cite a database, the databases are including the full URL, the really, really long version. Um, and some teachers are saying, you don't need the URL, take it out. So the, and we'll look at a couple examples of the databases and you can kind of see what those look like. But if they're citing a website, would you want the URL to be included? Just a regular website that's not through a database. Just curious. 
Lisa saying yes or no? I would. Because if you're deciding yes URLs or no URLs, then I think it gets to a point where then if you cite a website, do I not have to include the URL then? Yeah, that's a good question. So I don't know, just putting that out there. I like it because it goes right to a new specific source. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, at a different I'll, time, it's always evolving. <laughs> well, that is that is one component. But I I wonder just with uh, if it's a regular website or a news news site that isn't behind a paywall or something like that. With the information in those containers, you should be able to Google it and come up with the same result mm -hmm. uh, with that. So I mean, I I kind of default to it's taking up a lot of time and space. That's the argument for not including it, that as long as you're including enough information where they can find it again, which is the major goal, that they could get it. This is perhaps a slightly off topic, but the last time I looked at EBSCO, they, mm -hmm. they didn't, the, their citation tool was only for MLA7. They've know? changed it. They've changed Just it. Just recently. Just recently. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll show you those. They, they <coughs> actually look pretty good. Sometimes, like, EBSCO doesn't do things very well. It's a couple little <laughs> tricks, um, but yeah. And the edition is still the same, right? It's part of the title, because I can't find, and you know, like the edition of different books, you still do it the same way. That, that actually falls into the version uh, element. Or, or after? So you would put it after the editors now. Uh, I'll have to look at the yeah, guide. I haven't memorized it yet, sorry. I, <laughs> I just can't find anything with the additions, because that, that's really important. I tried to include, and we'll look at the how I've set up our guidelines, hand out the green one, yeah. because it's a different than what we've done before, and that's why I wanted to kind of show you our logic behind it. But we'll, I think I included an example that had an addition, because the textbooks have an addition. They have a like shorter edition and 12th edition and all that kind of good stuff. Um, but those are the... Those are the other changes. Um, the other ones are, oh, they've omitted the format, so you don't have print, you don't have web, you don't have DVD, you don't have those kinds of things, so that's another thing. Um, but in terms of, actually, and maybe just to save us time a little bit, the other link here for MLA Style Center is essentially goes to this page. But I did want to give you this because it's a nice overview of all the different um, major changes. Uh, the other things were the way they do abbreviations, uh, a couple little things about authors, um, instead of including the first, I think they used to have where the, it's the first two, and then if you had more, then you put at all. And now if you have more than two, you just put the first one and at all. So it shortens the author a little bit. So just a few little things, journals, online works. Oh, another thing with the, with the URL, even though they include the URL, they don't want the HTTP and the slashes. If it starts with www, you can include that, but if it just goes HTTP and then like, Citrus College, whatever, then you just start with Citrus College. It might look a little weird because you're used to things starting with that. And I looked in their book to figure out why they did that. I don't know why, but they just said take off the HTTP. A lot of that's changing right now anyway in terms mm. of web, you know, the web browsers and things like that. So you just type in the Sometimes it has words. a 2, sometimes it has an yeah. S, and I think maybe because of the it's nature of that. Two or that's true. Yeah. That's true. Um, so that's one thing that's kind of funky about the URLs, I think. Uh, and then just a few little miscellaneous things. So this is just, you know, kind of additional little minor changes that I would point out. So below here is, uh, we're talking about the, well, I guess we kind of talked about the container a little bit. The thing that I think is different about this container is that when you're citing something, um, the original source of where it was published, it's also done a little differently too because um, in the past, we usually be citing the original source you're looking at, then the original source, then the database. But the original publication is actually at the end now. And they have a statement that actually says originally published in, mm -hmm. if you're including that. So not everybody may be including that too. Um, oh, because because we're talking about the containers, let me show you the video. I know, who else has seen the video? I know Eric has seen it. Anybody else? Hang in there. It's only five minutes. I don't know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I always learn something new. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. Um, so I'm actually on this guide. I've, I've linked back to our original one, which is probably on the Oh, you did? Wow. Oh, I like that. So this link is here. And we also have a YouTube channel where all of our videos are stored. So we have eight of them that he's done, and then we have some that we've made. Let me see. Let me hope. Hopefully this audio is working okay. I have this plugged in. Let me see. Oh yeah. Well, I don't know. 
Um, I hope you can hear that. Yeah. All right, let's talk about that real quick. This is this guy's name is Josh Fossler. Very nice guy. Let's talk MLA Eighth Edition. First, there's a couple of concepts that you need to understand. Sources and containers. Sources are things you actually read, watch, or listen to that provide information. So an article, a book, or a video. Containers are anything that houses a source or another container. Now for an example citation. We start by gathering information, kind of like collecting puzzle pieces. For a journal article from a library database, we need information about our source, the first container, and the second container. All together, there are nine pieces of information you need. For the source, we only need the author and the article's title, which are right up here at the top of the first page. Next comes the first container. For a scholarly article, every scholarly article, the first container is the journal that published that article. You can find the journal's title at the top or bottom of one of the article's pages. Next, we need the volume and issue numbers. Journal articles are organized kind of like TV shows. Seasons are like volumes, episodes are like issues. Look for two numbers close to each other, like this. Volume always comes before issue. Now we need the date this particular issue was published. Thankfully, it's right next door. All that's left are the page numbers. Starts in 109, goes through 118. Container 1, done. So the article, our source, lives inside the journal our first container. But that journal lives inside of a library database, our second container. For this container, we need the database's name, in this case, Academic Search Premier, and the URL where the article can be found. URLs can be tricky, bear with me here. This is Academic Search Premier. And here's my article. A reasonable person might think the URL would be right up here in the address bar, you know, where URLs live. No such luck. MLA wants a stable URL, sometimes called a permalink, and it won't be in the address bar. They'll have it hidden someplace like this. We now have all nine puzzle pieces. I'm going to pause for just a second. Uh, when EBSCO does provide the, the MLA citation, it does provide that persistent link. I was, when we were making this, I thought, make sure that everybody knows that that's the link that it's grabbing. But now that they've changed to eight, because they were at seven at that time, they do put that exact persistent link in the, 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 um, in the URL, in the citation for you. And I also noticed that, that the database name is Academic Search Premier here, but um, according to the book, they are okay if you put like a larger company name like EBSCOhost. But at first I thought if you have the detailed information, you can provide it. But when um, EBSCO provides their eight citations, they actually just use EBSCOhost. So that might be something that's a little bit different. Oh, okay. and, and I think that most people are okay with just whatever the database has right. to just use that. But um, those are a couple little things. Collected them in the order they appear, so that part's done. Making the pieces all fit together correctly with the right punctuation and labels, however, is where the work happens. If you only take one thing away from this video, it should be this. Every detail matters. Every comma, every space, every everything. Okay, here we go. Author. Last name, comma, first name, period, space. If you have more than one author, you drop in a comma, an and, the second author's name, which is written normally, first name, space, last name. We only flip the order of the first author's name to make it easier to alphabetize. If you've got three or more authors, you keep the comma after the first author's name and drop the words et al, Latin for and others, followed by a period. Article title. In a formatting fight between MLA and the actual article, MLA wins every time. Yeah, it seems odd, but it makes things simpler. This title is in all caps, but MLA asks for title case. Article titles also need to be surrounded by quotes, like so. Wait, that looks weird. Between the quotes in the title and the quotes MLA demands, that's a lot of quotation marks. Too many. When you're citing an article that has quotes in the title, like this one, MLA wants you to replace the double quotes of the original, these here, with single quotes. Lovely. Now for the first container. It starts with the journal title, which needs to be capitalized just like the article title, in title case, but it also takes italics. That way your reader knows, at a glance, which part of the citation is the article title and which is the journal title. Then a comma, the letters V-O-L, a period, a space, 
then the volume number, 59, followed by a comma, the letters N-O, a period, a space, the issue number, 2, followed by another comma and another space. Then comes the date, winter with a capitalized W, a space, the year, 2007, a comma, a space, and the page numbers, preceded by a lowercase pp, stands for pages plural, followed by a period. Whew, the first container is done. We are almost finished. Now for the second container, the database. Like the journal title, the database title takes title case and italics, followed by a comma and a space. After that comes the URL. Like this, look closely. The URL is black and formatted with the same font as the rest of the citation. It is not hyperlinked and omits all the stuff before the www. No colors, no underlines. And there you have it, a complete citation for a journal article in MLA 8th edition. That's the works cited entry, but what about in-text citation? Any thoughts? <coughs> it should be all double spaced, right? Yes, okay. and double spaced. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. And uh, if, you, if you do have someone who uh, pastes in a website, you know how to make it unhyperlinked. It's just backspace the very last line, and it takes the blue link off. But some, some students are not familiar with Wait, that. Wait, you backspace the last, at the very end of it? At the very end, it looks like you're going to backspace into the last letter, but it'll oh, backspace wow. the hyperlink oh. all of it. So if that happens. But I don't know. Some, some instructors are very picky about those things, and some of them aren't. So you get to choose what's important to you. I'm just wondering what the permalinks. I haven't done one in a while. So is that going to that permalink going to take you to the portal for Citrus so you can get in that database? Or are you going to be blocked by a paywall or something? When you use no, that? with with EBSCO and any of our databases, the way that they've decided the link, it will take you to uh, the place where it'll choose for them to log in. I believe. Choose for EBSCO to log in. For EBSCO. So yeah, you we need, have something. You are log in here and then get in. When they're, they're, it'll prompt them to log in with their My Library account which is what they use to get the databases off campus. I'm pretty sure the only thing I'm, I'm thinking that doesn't is that because the URL doesn't include what they call our proxy URL, which is basically the thing that triggers them to ask to log in, right. I'm wondering if that the persistent link that EBSCO gives it doesn't have that on it, and I wonder if it will work. We should look into that. Yeah, see. I'm just wondering. Because okay. I, I think what we might be able to do is, is ask them to add our proxy link on all persistent links, and that will prompt a login from off. If you're on campus, it'll take you right there. If you're off campus, it should log you in. It should prompt you to like authenticate that you're a student or a staff. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question, though. Um, this just has a tiny little bit left um, in text citations. And we do have a, there are, um, using other people's ideas goes into much more detail about this particular. Thankfully, that's pretty easy, although there are a couple ways to go about it, depending on whether or not you mention the author's name in the sentence. If you refer to something from the article without using the author's name, like this, we give credit by putting his last name in parentheses at the end of the sentence, followed by the page number where the information comes from. Easy enough. If you do mention the author's name in the sentence, like this, we only need to share the page numbers in parentheses. So, aren't there a bunch of special rules and exceptions that haven't been covered here? Absolutely, this is not a definitive guide. That's where the MLA handbook comes in. We've got one at Hayden Memorial Library's reference desk. Come on by and let us show you how it's done. So we hope that that will be helpful to students, just to kind of give them an overview. Um, but just to give an example of kind of the complex type of thing. Um, any questions or anything on the video or any other thoughts on that? Are these new additions floating around anywhere? I do I do not have one. How do you get one? Yeah, we're, we're, I, no, I don't have any. Okay. For the MLA uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. I thought for a moment it would be really I nice if one. I just had one for everyone, but I didn't have one. I was oh, like, okay. oh. <laughs> I didn't know like, who had it. Yeah. We have a few here. Okay. Um, I don't know if that's something. I got. I have one in my office. Oh, I'm all right. Yeah. yeah. I probably have to make it a pointer to come to the bar. Yeah, Sarah, the only the odds. I'm calling them old days. I don't know what like yeah, <laughs> yeah, really. uh, Students used to go on uh, is it easy bit mm -hmm. and rec corps and things like that, mm -hmm. and WorldCat. Mm -hmm. If they did that now, it's probably not going to work because this is so detailed in MLA 8. Yes, no. Well, any of the citation generators, and on our on this page, we have it on a, oh, we have it on the main page. 
the um, the previous one where it has the citation generators a couple pages back. But um, they are changing over to eight. But any citation generator is is not necessarily perfect. So right. it, you know, it's it's just a help to kind of use that. And a lot of students will use that, and they say, "Go for it." Compare it with what your teacher's giving you. Compare it with our handout. Mm -hmm. Compare it with you know the databases. A lot of times they don't even realize that the database is providing that. Mm -hmm. Like I had someone who came in with this long list of random websites for an English literature criticism assignment, and I thought, um, just to give newsflash, our databases actually do the citations for you, and they had no idea because they had the teacher hadn't brought them in yet. So, you know. Um, but yeah, they can be helpful, the citation generators. Okay. Um, and NoodleBib actually has some nice templates that are format based. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually something that is on this guide, the faculty guide, um, where they have um, how to do a website in NLA 8 and it has its own template just for that type of format. Mm -hmm. So if that's helpful at all for your students or for anybody who's kind of struggling with it, um, Noodle, NoodleBib. Yeah, NoodleBib. Noodle tools, NoodleBib. It's on the this faculty page here. Um, down here, and I'll show you that real quick, Noodle Tools on the source specific templates. And I didn't know that they had this. I actually borrowed this guide from another school, and they have um, how to do a book source, how to do a periodical, and this is all, they kind of made their own version of, you know, how to cite a website using NLA 8 with this little template that they've created. Mm -hmm. So if, if that's something that you want to adapt, there, they, it is already created. Um, and it kind of shows them that this would be italicized and how the commas would go and that sort of thing. And, and then why is the source useful? I thought was a nice addition to the template. And this is Noodle? Noodle Tools. tools. Yeah, and this is listed on the, the guide that I have, um, the faculty guide that we're kind of working on today. What time is it? I'm going to try to All right. Uh, so speaking of the details, <laughs> uh, let's look at the actual guidelines, that green sheet that's in front of you. Because this is kind of what we use a lot at the reference desk with students. And I, I must admit that I did borrow this with permission from Mount Sac. This is the format that they used. I got copies from Mount Sac and PCC and Chafee to see what they're using for their MLA handout. Um, and so I, we've decided that I, I like we like this one the best. Um, all of them had different kinds of features that were nice. and so. Um, some of the uh, examples I realized are heavy on zombies and Harry Potter <laughs> and like random stuff like that. So like, I try to mix up the examples, but those are not those are not me. It's going to be way more work to find unique examples. So what we've been in, um, teaching students in the instruction sessions is that these common elements are the, the core of how this uh, new format is set up. So there are um, the, the author section. And then these are some examples of different authors. And this is literally how the, the, the MLA handbook is set up. It gives a single author example, two authors, three or more authors, etc. So this is a little bit of an example about why, uh, you know, what to do with that format. You know, last name, comma, first name, it's reversed, that type of information. And then we've given examples that include that particular element. So this would be a single author example. This is a two author example. But at the same time, this is also an example of how to do a book. And this is also an example, this is, happens to be a book example as well. So it's a little different than our other handout because it, it, the primary purpose of this is to show a single author. But at the same time, these examples are all going to be showing other kind of unique types of examples that you might come across. So two, ex two authors is, is listed here. Three or more authors is where you'd use the the et al. If you have three or more, you just have to list the first one. Uh, but the city is, is going to be missing, so that's one thing that's different. So that's, you'll see that in any printed source here. If there's no author and it's just an editor, then the entry begins with an editor. And it will have last name, first name, comma, editor. So that's something that's kind of different. Yeah, in the past you'd have the title of the book mm -hmm. and then the editor with a comma ed type of thing. Does that change the index too? Uh, if you're citing, you would do, you know, in this case, you'd do Charlie Boy, page five. Or, really? Okay. Yeah, because it's <clears throat> the in-text is always just pointing to the entry in the works cited. So if it's an editor, then you're pointing the person to the, you know, that entry in works cited, if I'm understanding that correctly. If there's no author, oh, you're thinking like you got you the title of the book? Yeah, I was just trying mm -hmm. to think like... Mm -hmm. We could double check that, yeah. yeah. I was trying to, uh, my look on my face is I was trying to remember what the MLA 7 was. 
Well, I think it starts like with the title. I don't think it starts with an editor. Yeah, I think it starts with a title. Seven was with the title, yeah. And so the in-text would be referring to the title. Yeah. So I would guess, and I, we would have to double-check the book, but I would guess that this would be the editor's name would be different. And that's, I wonder if that's one of the things in the in-text that, that might be noted that's different. Um, hmm. It doesn't refer to that specific, but, but I should double check that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's why we're here to kind of look at those things. I'm in no way, but I should have a disclaimer. In no way an expert, an expert on MLA 8. I'm right here with you, I'm learning as we go. Making this handout itself was actually a really good experience, just kind of getting in there and looking at all the little details. And I constantly look at this and find like, oh, there's a period where they're in the wrong space or something. So if you catch something, I know I try to send everything to Anna Villeneuve because I know that she's going to catch details. <laughs> so I have a few, a few extra detail oriented to put. Um, so editors, uh, if there's a pseudonym or if they're, especially if they're citing something like this is a YouTube um, citation, so whatever the username is or the person's name that they're using to post it um, would be used just how it, you wouldn't switch around the name, you just put what their, their name is, like for tweets, for example, too. Um, but if you have... Hmm? I know commas, right? You know, like not, not for a pseudonym. Um, yeah, if you did, if you're listing, if they list their name, like I, I, I was helping a history of hair class actually cite Instagram pictures, and so I was, you look at their their username, but if they list their real name, I was, not this is in seven, I, I guess maybe it would be just the username, but I was thinking if they listed their name, that maybe you would actually list their name, last name, first name, but I might have to check on that one too. But yeah, a lot of people are citing images. There's actually a lot of um, science teachers right now that are having their students cite any image that they use in a presentation. And they're coming to us asking, how do I cite this picture? I have all these pictures and I need to cite them. So I'm actually, it's kind of a challenge, but I'm actually excited that people are, are finally <laughs> citing images because that is uh, an issue too. Uh, but titles, this would be titles that are self-contained sources. So these are things that, um, if it's a, sh a story of a, uh, or if it's a smaller web page within a website, the title would be the page that they're citing. If it's an essay, like this is an example of an essay in uh, Preen Story and Structure, and I tried to add one of these because I know a lot of people are citing in a short story in uh, an anthology of some kind. So the author would be first, and then it's an example of a title of sources that are part of a larger source. So that will, I think you'll probably come across that a lot. So that's just kind of how these are set up, but you can see other examples within, um, built into those examples for each of these items. Um, this is an example of a website or a page on a website that doesn't have an author, so obviously it just starts with the title of the source and then the larger source where it comes from and the URL. Um, I have added the access date here. That's something that is optional. So the, and some of the databases are including it and some of them aren't. If you want students to include it, they can add their own access date, but it's it's totally up to you. So that might be something that, that if you bring your classes in, we might talk about, or if you wanted to make that clear to your students. But this is an example of how you would add a website and an access date. And then, uh, yeah, this is a, a, an example of where it has a website, but not an access date. And, of course, there it is. Missing a period. I just spoke too soon. <laughs> Shoot. All right. Uh, so, uh, so after the title comes the other contributors, so this is uh, if there are illustrations or if it's translated or if there are additional contributors of whatever kind, this is where those would go. And you can, sometimes it depends on what you're citing, whether to include those or not. If you don't have to include all those details, if it's not relevant to the actual citation. Uh, the version is referring to the edition. So you had asked earlier, how do you cite editions? Identify the version number or description, um, such as revised, which is actually should be REV. So some databases are spelling that out. Some of them are abbreviating it. Like EBSCO is notorious for spelling revised out when it really should be abbreviated. And it's not capitalized if it's after a comma. Right. These are little things. Yeah, yeah. because I, I saw the one with the edition mm -hmm. where you have an editor, and it is different. The other one, you put the edition right after the title. If you go on the back side, you have one or both. Oh, on the other side? Yeah, on the back. And there's yeah. one that has an edition, and but an editor. editor. So the, when, when there's yeah. both the ed editor yeah. and an edition, it's now the edition's after the editors. 
Okay. If you look on the back side, okay. there's an example of that. Okay. So but you're not saying that these are incorrect. No, no, no. no, 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 no this one we have, okay. have uh, you know what I'm saying? I have these are both. Okay. Which okay. like the preen does. And so the example of your preen, just so you know, it is always an addition number. Yeah, and that's true. I should put an addition number. So we're on the 14th edition, so that would go after the edited by. Because if you look at this, this uh, on the back page where it says Black Brian. Oh, edited by, and the edition would go... Well, go to the end of your second page, please. You see where it says black, see how it says the editors are there? Edited by, and then the second edition. And then the edition yeah, after the Yeah, that's editor. really different. Yes, yeah, so if the, if print right. does have an edition, I, could, I should probably sneak that yeah, in. Yeah, I, I would see really in that example. They do, if you can okay. squeeze it, whatever. But. Yeah, yeah, that's why we're, you know, I want to have a lot more eyes on this. We only have a few eyes. <laughs> So it would be 14th ED period. It wouldn't be small ED. Yes, right. after the editor. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's different. It would be in this format. Yeah, yeah. And after. Usually it's back to the title. That's what we're, you know, which mm -hmm. that's sense different. To me, but and the word mm -hmm. edited yeah. is spelled yeah. out too. Right. So you, that's something that's and different. The edited, edited by. Edited. Yeah, yeah, I know. And a lot of our databases, actually, the one that this probably came, well, if this is from a, our Gale Virtual Reference Library, it often has ED period and then the listing of an editor, yeah. and so um, you'll just have to make sure that when right. they start getting cited. Okay. Most of the databases are actually pretty good about the citations, um, but I'm glad you're pointing that out. Um, after version is number. And in this case, the number is, uh, there's a couple different examples when you're doing periodicals. If there is an issue in a, in a volume or something like that, um, if there isn't, then you wouldn't, you just skip it. Um, Multi-volume sets, you'd also put a number. Isn't this a lovely one right here? Overview of Sunny's Blues. Look at that. <laughs> you know you love, that's your favorite one, right? <laughs> uh, so, and I did include that because that's a common source that a lot of students right. use. Um, so, yeah, up here for periodicals, if you're citing, confronting the zombie apocalypse. See, this is has academic search premiere. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to be consistent, I probably should make all those be EBSCO. But what do you? I mean, do you have a preference about whether it's a specific database or whether it's the larger kind of collection? So what is the larger one? one? EBSCO. Oh, EBSCO. There's about 40 databases. Well, maybe 20 databases under EBSCO, and they all have different names, like I psychology and behavioral sciences. And but um, they're saying that you could just use EBSCO as long as it gets people back to the general. I don't think it's that big of a deal. I think EBSCO would be fine. Yeah. I don't think there's a way to get to money. Yeah, there are. I think that's the drop down like, logic behind it. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You're going for the author first, then, you know, through this, and that's why it's at the bottom, because there's multiple ways to get to that journal a lot yeah. of times or that website. So I matters yeah. yeah, I think most, I haven't run into anybody who's really concerned about that. Uh, but this one, if they are getting something that doesn't have an author like this overview example, um, it does have the editor, the volume, the date. So this is a double container. So it originally appeared in the printed book and then it was now available in the second container here, Literature Resource Center. And then this URL is actually the proxy. So anytime you see citruscollege.idm, that's that's the thing, if you clicked on that, then you get the login page. But EBSCO doesn't provide this little proxy before the URL. D a detail you probably would never know, know about and care about, but that's kind of that, that little trigger that's going to make um, ask people to log in. And that has an access date on it. So that's why these look really long. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you want people to, to you know cut that out, you're welcome to, as long as they do it consistently. I right. think most people just want, whatever you're going to do, just be consistent about it. Um, with the student. The publisher information, uh, university presses can still be UP. Um, some of those things haven't changed. General publishers, they also are, they talk about omitting the business terms, such as company, corporation, incorporation. So you don't have to include the business terms along with it. You can just include like Gale or whatever the, uh, getting right to the point of the individual book. Um, and then the websites, of course, uh, are, uh, this is actually publisher if it's a website. If the publisher is the same company as the the, uh, the name of the website and the publisher of the website are sometimes the same thing, so you only have to list them once. So that's something that also that's a little bit different. Um, five things you didn't know about squirrels. <laughs> Just look that up in January. Lots of squirrels around here. <laughs> Publication date, you can see examples here. If you have one, if you don't have one, obviously you would leave that out. If it's a video or a DVD recording, 
Um, you can put, like this is an example of these new containers. So you have HBO Home Entertainment. So if you're watching it through a service like Hulu or Netflix or something like that, you would cite it. If it's a DVD, then you would be um, you know, noting the relevant, whatever the date is or the name, the date of the DVD set or something like that. And just, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and if, I mean, depending on what it's for, if it's for a, a film class and you're citing like which which disc in the set did you use and what time stamp, you could get that detailed if you wanted to. But yeah, Game of Thrones, episode three, disc two. As opposed to watching it on a streaming collection, because a lot of DV, a lot of media like this is going into a streaming format, so that's why they're. This shows without saying DVD, disc two triggers. Oh, that's a that's a hard copy of. Something. So let's say you are streaming something that's live. Mm -hmm. Do you have to just is that where you do the cutoff? You know, like it was two hours and twenty three minutes and sixty. You only minutes. use that if it's relevant to the, the the source that you're citing, like the context that you're citing it. If you're just saying I watched this movie and I'm commenting on the general theme of it, then you might not need the. Little but if it's like an interview about the author, let's right. say, then they. You want to have the minute, maybe, or is that what you're saying? If you want to, okay. that's one of those things where. So would kids yeah. transfer to the four year university? Because before it seemed like it was more set. Do they have to ask? I mean, should we be telling our students make sure you check with your professors because just because we allow certain things here, don't assume that that's going to happen, right? Because I always used to feel more secure that if we taught it here, they would just do the same thing. But it's not anymore. Well, every individual person, even here, I work with a lot right, of different right. teachers, and everybody here does seven differently. Everybody here is um, doing eight differently. Like some people are going to say, nope, no URLs, and that's how we're going to do that class, and that's how that teacher is going to grade that. But I always encourage the teacher to look to look at what the teachers, your professors, are giving you. That's such a good rule for no matter what. And sometimes at the four university, the teachers kind of assume, so they may want to, right? They don't. They should treat. know what the what the formal version is, right. And how to go to how to get resources to answer those questions. Right. I wouldn't. They should never go assuming. Well, my last teacher right, didn't yeah. like this, and I'm sure this one doesn't too. Yeah. yeah okay. But as long as they know where to go to get the you know the Bible, right? Then I think that they should be they should be safe. But yeah, that's why I, I I try to encourage anyone who's contemplating seven to use eight because they're just we're just moving forward right. here. <laughs> um, but the location is not what you might think. It's kind of a, a, a kind of an odd <coughs> word to use. But for print sources, the location is referring to the page numbers. Mm -hmm. So if it's one page, it's a one p. If it's two or more pages, it's the pp period here. If it's a if the other location, if it's an online or digital type of source then the location is the URL. So, or they have a preference now, which is different from MLA, to include DOIs if you have it, the digital object identifier. I call it the social security number of the article, because that DOI number will be the same if it's in EBSCO or if it's in Gale, it'll follow it everywhere. So if that's available to you to use it, and the databases that do have that available are incorporating it into the kind of generated citation. Oh, they are. Okay. So I, I never saw this, and I only see this in APA. So I thought, well, did the MLA citations actually include it? Uh -huh. But now they're they are including it if it's available. It's not for every article, but it's pre preferred because it's the most direct way to find the article. So those are the optional elements with um, if it's previously published somewhere else so that's kind of this is an example of how to cite the original originally published somewhere so this is an article that was in short stories for students the printed edition that originally was published in a journal and we find this a lot especially with English one. it used to be like reprinted right? reprint right. reprinted right. in is what right. it used to have so right. this is and that was uh, earlier in the citation this is now later right. in the citation, yeah. at the very end right yeah so that's the one thing that's mm -hmm. kind of different so that's a little fun walk through my fun little video. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> the periods and the commas and the it's yeah. kind of crazy making. So I appreciate your <laughs> patience coming through with some of those things. Um, the only other thing, let me see, what's our what's our time here? I can tell you guys are fading. It's a mid -day. mid day. We'll do that to you. The <laughs> sciences workshops are fifteen minutes say, long. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> someone's at four o'clock, but I don't want to. Oh yeah, we're actually almost done. So maybe we'll have time to torture you with doing an assignment like your students would do. So you can thank me later on that. Um, the, the last thing I did want to show you is the. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, I should serve some like espresso chocolate. Thing or something. No. <laughs> 
Um, the other thing I did want to show you is the other handout that's in your little packet there, this template. And this is what we, we're just trying some different things out to see what would be helpful. The blank template mm. is, um, is what the, is in the back of the MLA book. This is, um, they have a copy of this on the MLA style guide. And so you can either make a copy of it if you want, but they also have it, I don't know where it is in here, but um, it's on their website. So because if we just gave this to a student, they'd be like, uh, <laughs> what's the size of it? And so we made a two-page handout here um, that you're welcome to copy or get from our website that kind of walks them through just a little short version of what those look like. So short explanation of what that is and which MLA pages in the book give more detail on it. So that's essentially what those are. The title of the source would be here, the title of the container, the smaller container is first, the larger container is, is last, just like the or my little my little Kleenex box that I made today. <laughs> so it has, you know, of course we have websites that are, you know, in the uh, web page that's in a website. We might have an, an article that's in a journal that's in a database, you know. So I don't know, sometimes it just helps to kind of we have a chapter in an ebook that's in EBSCO ebook collection. Let's flip it in that collection. So so, the, the, so we have multiple Kleenex boxes in the library for you to access virtually. <laughs> or or here on campus. So is this available as a PDF online? Yes. This is um, all the things that I'm sharing with you today are on our, from our library homepage, if you go to citations, mm -hmm. this is the main page that does have all of our APA, Chicago, and MLA. But um, our MLA guide has the, the green handout mm -hmm. right here, the practice template and the, the two page thing we just looked at, the one you, the also the in text and the format which mm -hmm. you have in your packet. Mm -hmm. I don't, I didn't print out the sample paper. And this just goes to Purdue and then this is the guide that we talked about today. So that guide has the noodle tools um, mm -hmm. templates on it. That's the only other thing that you might have to kind of sneak into the faculty one because I thought I don't want to put too much stuff out here. Um, and, and we also have our, uh, our workshops. So the other thing that's attached to your packet is we have less workshops mm -hmm. this year. We were able to offer a lot more. We've actually offered 80 workshops since July 1st total, thanks to student equity. But um, we don't have that student equity funding anymore. <laughs> so we have less workshops. So we have uh, 15 workshops that we've scheduled for this semester. And they're all going to be taught in this room. We've kind of reorganized where things are. So we're doing smaller groups. And we've also allowed that room to be more of a study area for students. That's why we're not meeting in, in the, the gallery there or the multi-purpose room. But these are the workshops that are also available right here on this page. And they are also, um, there's a link on the top here to get to the, the main workshop page where we have um, APA style, we're doing avoiding plagiarism, finding primary and secondary sources. A lot of the history faculty were asking us for those. Um, MLA, obviously, and then we've collaborated with the counselors. We're offering uh, resume workshops. Um, the counselors are doing them here in the library and also uh, picking a major, calling it choosing a major or a career is what they're doing. So we have our handouts to, of our flyers and our career workshops that are linked on the, the page there so you can this is the one for our workshop but we have a little on the table actually there's a little small pocket size one of the career workshops but they're also on our, our website too. Do you have any of your workshops pre-recorded? Um, not yet because we just we're just starting them this month um, I'm doing this one just to hope to see if it can be something that we can share with other faculty and we're doing a fly workshop on faculty learning institute and hopefully people will be able to get flex day for attending and I'm going to try to record it and see if there's any way to possibly get flex credit from watching it. But that's just like an experiment that we're trying to set up maybe through Blackboard or something mm -hmm. uh, to kind of see how we can get that going. But, um, but everything is, is linked on our website, as you, you probably know. And we try to, we're trying to make as many things convenient because I know it's, it's hard to get here in the middle of the day. So I really appreciate your taking the time to, to come Thank here. You. It's really good. Yeah, yeah, I, did, I hope that that's helpful. Just the time to kind of talk about it. Yeah, we have we have gone to classes and many things. We haven't done MLA workshops in class, but usually uh, uh, faculty will bring their students here to the library. But we're open to you know all kinds of different creative things. Thank you. Thank you for coming. You're welcome. Sure.